Hello, welcome back to video number 20. Today's mission is to model the rear fairing. So let's jump right in. First, you want to bring up the gizmo, then select the polycube from the gear. Press delete loops and scale it up a bit. Once you've done that, give it a bit of a scale on the Z axis to thin it out. Now with the face on mask, you'll want to taper it down. Hold control and move the gizmo to extrude. Then we can scale it to match our reference. We're going to be doing a bit of repetitive work now. A little bit of extruding and shaping with the gizmo. Unmask the back and move it upwards. Then unmask the front and extrude it a few times. So for the next few minutes, it's more of the same. A whole lot of extruding and scaling. So while that plays in the background, let's chat a bit about some features we've used in this series but haven't really dived deep into. I'm talking about the array mesh and nano mesh. While they may not be the superstars of hard surface modeling, they've got a lot going for them. Let's break down the array mesh first. So let's say you're working on a model and you realize you need to create multiple instances of it in a pattern or an array. Maybe you're creating chains, scales, or just any detail that needs to be copied and pasted a bunch of times. That's where Array Mesh comes in. It lets you create all those instances in no time. But here's the cool part. With Array Mesh, you get to see a real-time preview of all those duplicated elements. So if you adjust the original mesh, you'll see those changes popping up instantly. It's like having a mirror that reflects every move you make. Now you might be thinking, all those copies must be a nightmare for my computer's memory. But that's the beauty of Array Mesh. It creates instances, not actual geometry duplicates. So you can build these complex scenes without piling on the poly count or overworking your system. Array Mesh isn't just about making copies though. It gives you the control over position, scale, and rotation of your instances. That means you can pull off these complex transformations and patterns that would be super tough to do by hand. And another really cool thing about it is you can pair up Array Mesh with ZBrush's Nano Mesh and Z Modeler, so you can get even more ways to duplicate and play around with your models. So if you're looking to add some complexity and detail to your ZBrush projects, Without making things too complicated or maxing out your system, Array Mesh is definitely a tool you'll want to check out. Okay, next up is Nano Mesh. So imagine you're working on a hard surface model and need to add in repeating details like rivets, bolts, grills, or tiles. Nano Mesh is your go to tool for this. It lets you duplicate these elements across your model's surface super easy. But hard surface objects aren't usually perfect, right? They've got a bit of natural imperfection or wear and tear. That's where randomization and nano mesh comes in handy. You can control how these instances get shuffled around on the surface to create that real world look. One of the best things about nano mesh is how memory efficient it is. The instances don't add to your total polygon count until you make them part of the actual geometry. So you can go all out on complex hard surface models without worrying about bogging down your system. And when it comes to hard surface modeling, precision is king. And that's why Nano Mesh is such a great fit. When you use it with ZModeler, you get a high level of precision, which is just what you need for those crisp, clean hard surface models. Plus with Nano Mesh, any changes you make to the base mesh shows up in real time in the instances. So you can adjust your model on the fly making your workflow super efficient and flexible. And another great thing about NanoMesh, it gives you a non-destructive workflow. That means you can play around, make changes, and try different things without messing up your underlying geometry. So when it comes to hard surface modeling in ZBrush, NanoMesh is definitely a tool you want in your toolkit. It makes adding detailed, repeating elements a breeze, all while keeping your workflow smooth and efficient. All right, let's shift gears a bit. 
but want to alt tag these four polys, but don't forget to turn on symmetry in the X axis first. Then Q mesh them up. Now unmask those polys and move them up a bit. Unmask the points and reposition the extruded faces. Now from the bottom view, let's add in a few more edge loops. Grab that Move Infinite Depth Brush and get those edges into position. Next up, insert a couple of edge loops using the Z Mahler Brush. Then switch it right back to the Move Infinite Depth Brush. Weld it in the x-axis and start collapsing those edges down. Then back again to the Move Infinite Depth Brush, let's flatten out this slope. Unmask the middle poly and run a Polish by Features. Moving right along, let's add four edge loops at the bottom. Then click Weld Points with the Weld Distance around 6. Next up, let's select Inset a Single Poly and Alt Tag these 10 faces. Do the same on the inside too. You mesh the polygroup island to create the hole, then press Ctrl W to group visible. Now we want to choose bridge for the polygon action and two polys for the target. Select the middle poly and delete it. Then click on weld points. For the Z Mahler brush, let's choose a line for the edge action edge strip and straight lines for the target with a specified curvature of zero. Go ahead and delete these five polys. Then let's not forget about the polys on the inside too. Let's delete those as well. Then select insert multiple edge loops and add two edge loops. Now we can press Ctrl W to group visible. Next, select bridge for the edge action and edges for the target. Let's slide those edges over a tad to keep the poly loop consistent. Then snap it to the bottom view. Turn on symmetry and add in two edge loops. And for good measure, let's add in one more edge loop with the slice curve brush. Unmask those edges and move them over with the gizmo, prepping for the holes. For the Z Baller brush, select Split for the point action, point for the target, 
and triangle center for the modifier. Now we can switch to Extrude Polygroup All. Then select Scale Polygroup All. Go ahead and add an edge loop right down the middle of each hole. Press QC50, then Control W to Group Visible. Lower that crease level down to 3, then select Crease Edge Loop Partial and make a few creasing adjustments. Mask out the model and bring up the gizmo again. From the gear, select the polycube. Invert the mask and split unmasked points. Go ahead and turn off dynamic and scale up the cube a bit. Unmask the face and move it out a little. Then scale it in the X axis. Go ahead and weld in the x-axis and grab the slice curve brush to add in an edge loop. Unmask the middle edge loop and scale it in the x-axis. Let's go ahead and really scale it in the z-axis to get it nice and thin. Alright, so since we've got a few more minutes of similar steps, let's take a closer look at a couple of features we've been using a lot. Unify and delete loops. Let's chat about the Unify function in ZBrush. You know how sometimes when you're working with 3D models, they can end up all different sizes, especially when you're importing models from different softwares. It can turn into a bit of a mess. That's where Unify comes in. It's like a magic button that standardizes the size of your models. You can find it hanging out in the deformation palette. So what does Unify do? Well, when you press that button, ZBrush scales your selected model so it snugly fits in with a two-unit bounding box and places the subtool in the middle of the world. It takes the longest dimension of your model, whether that's height, width, or depth, and scales it to two units. Why two units? Well, that's the standard size ZBrush uses for its own tools and primitives. One thing to keep in mind is that Unify works on a per-subtool basis. So that's Unify in a nutshell. It's a handy little function for standardizing the size of your models and keeping your workflow clean and straightforward. Next, let's talk about the delete loops function in ZBrush. You know how your 3D model is made up of all these edge loops, those continuous lines of edges looping around your model's geometry? They're super important for shaping your model and adding detail but sometimes you can end up with way more than you actually need. That's where delete loops comes in. So you'll find delete loops hanging out under the geometry palette within the edge loop tab. What it does is pretty much what it sounds like. It deletes edge loops, but it's not just randomly deleting stuff. It's actually analyzing your model, figuring out which edge loops aren't really adding much to the overall form of your model based on the angle you set, and then getting rid of those. It's a neat way to cut down your polygon count and make your model a bit easier to work with. But here's the thing. Delete Loops doesn't let you choose which edge loops are getting deleted. It's all automatic, based on what the algorithm decides after checking out your model's geometry and the angle you set. It's super quick and easy, but if you want more control over your topology, you might want to go in and delete the edge loops by hand. Another one I use quite often is Crease PG. You can find it hiding out in the Geometry Crease menu. And PG here 
stands for polygroups. Now when you press that crease PG button, ZBrush is going to look at your model and wherever it sees an edge separating one polygroup from another, it's going to slap a crease on it. It's a pretty handy way to add creases, especially if you already got your model split up into polygroups. Oh, and here's a little cool tip. You can adjust how intense the crease is by using the crease level slider. Since we're on the subject of polygroups, Group by Normals is a handy feature in ZBrush located in the Polygroups menu. What it does is create separate polygroups based on the surface normals of your model. Think of surface normals as an arrow that's sticking straight out of the face of your model, showing you which way the face is pointing. So with Group by Normals, ZBrush is looking at where these imaginary arrows are pointing. And if they're not pointing in the same direction, within a certain degree, it separates them into a different polygroup. Now you get to decide how big of a difference in direction there needs to be before ZBrush splits them into different polygroups. That's where the max angle slider comes in. You can adjust that angle depending on your needs. This tool can be super helpful when you're working on hard surface models or any model with faces that are clearly defined. By automatically grouping faces based on their direction, you can easily isolate, hide, or manipulate different parts of your model. All right, let's circle back and add in an edge loop. Then QMesh the poly through to delete it. Unmask the edge and using our gizmo, move it up to get it all lined up. Now choose QMesh a single poly. Unmask the edge and adjust it a bit with the gizmo. Unmask the face and extrude it with the gizmo. Next with the gizmo again, unmask the poly and adjust its position. Keep adjusting the edges so they match the reference. Go ahead and select Move for the point action and by brush size for the target. Now it's time to select Crease, Edge Loop Partial and get those creases set up. Switch to the other subtool and start adjusting those creases with the Z-Modeler brush. Next, pick Bridge for the Polygon action and two polys for the target. Then crease the new polygroup. 
Select insert multiple edge loops to add an edge loop right in the middle. Unmask the edge loop and move it back with the gizmo. With symmetry turned on in the x-axis, slide that edge back. Alt tag the two polys and extrude them out with the gizmo. Alright, time for a crease cleanup session. Now we can reposition those edges with the Z-Moller brush. Go ahead and press Ctrl W to group visible. Unmatch the two polys and reposition them using the gizmo. Now let's bring back the visibility of the other subtool and see how well they're matching up. Go ahead and add an edge loop with symmetry turned on in the X axis. Time to add in an edge loop with the Z-Moller brush. From the point action, let's select Slide. Go ahead and mask the edge, invert the mask, and then mask out the rear point. Let's move the point with the gizmo. What we're aiming for here is a nice straight angle. So unmask the point and run a polish by features. Now let's select the top subtool and merge it down. But remember to have the UV button turned off. Let's go ahead and mask that edge and then invert it. Bring up our gizmo and move it forward. Then go ahead and unmask the other edge and position it into place.
Now let's add one more edge loop on top so we can match the topology on both meshes. Add an edge loop on the bottom to prep for bridging. Go ahead and pick bridge for the polygon action and two polys for the target. Next up, select Q mesh a single poly. Press Ctrl W to group visible and then press QC50. Let's go ahead and make a few creasing adjustments here and there. Slide the edge loop down a bit, and then bridge those polys together. Next, slide the edge down and Q-mesh the poly. Now we can sort out a few errors that snuck in during our mirror and weld. Let's press Ctrl W to group visible. Then use the slide action in the Z modeler brush to adjust the model. While we're at it, let's also adjust the creasing of what we have so far. Use the Z Mahler's move to fine tune the thickness of the poly loop. Select Move for the Edge action to adjust the angle. Alt tag these three faces and scale them flush. Let's do the same for the polys on the other side too. And finally, let's straighten out the edge by sliding the point back a bit. Okay, let's delete the two edge loops for a cleaner transpose. Unmask that middle edge loop with transpose edge loop partial. 
Snap to the side view and move it with the gizmo. Then clear the mask. Turn on symmetry in the x-axis and bring back the edge loop we just got rid of. Then Q-Mesh for the polygon action and poly loop for the target. Let's go ahead and slide that edge loop down a bit. Then Q-Mesh the single poly. Unmask the edge and reposition it with the gizmo. Now we can add another edge loop and then Q-Mesh a single poly. Go ahead and select Transpose Edge and match it to the reference. Add in two more edge loops on the back with insert multiple edge loops. Let's go ahead and remove the creasing for them. Transpose the edge and soften that transition. Now Q-Mesh a single poly. When one face doesn't work as expected with Q-Mesh, oftentimes another face will. Alt click on the point to adjust with the gizmo and reposition the edge. Q-Mesh the top two polys and reposition them with the gizmo. We'll just want to keep Q-Meshing down and adjusting with the gizmo. Unmask the point and bring down the height. Now we can slide those two edges down slightly and uncrease the top. Add an edge loop right down the middle with insert multiple edge loops. Select inset a single poly and alt tag those eight faces. We can tap Alt to change the polygroup color as you inset. Inset again, but this time use Polygroup Island and tap Alt to change the polygroup. Select QMesh Polygroup Island and hold Shift to switch it to a move operation. Swap the Q-Mesh target to poly loop and extrude inwards. Transpose the edge to give it some height. Press Ctrl W to group visible. And from the Z Modeler brush, pick crease for the polygon action, 
poly loop for the target and outer targets for the modifier. Now we can turn on dynamic to see our progress. We're going to have a lot of cleanup work to do with creasing. So let's go ahead and switch off dynamic. So switching off dynamic will make the creasing of the edges easier. Once you've done that, turn dynamic back on to see what we missed. Unmask the edges and move them over to straighten them up. Alright, let's start sliding some edges to get our topology ready for an extrusion. Pick Inset a single poly and Alt tag those eight faces. We can tap Alt while insetting to change the poly group. Next, let's Q mesh the poly group island. Holding down Shift as you Q mesh will switch it to a move operation. Now, from the Z model brush, choose a line for the edge action, edge strip, and straight lines for the target, and specified curvature of zero for the modifier. Go ahead and set up our creases for the poly groups. Let's turn on dynamic and continue adjusting the creases. Now we're going to want to transpose that corner edge. Next we want to align the edges straight. Next we want to align the side edges and slide the middle edges back. Inset that middle polygroup and redo the creasing. Alt tag those six faces to extrude. Then let's delete the back faces. Now we can stitch those points together. Changing the polygon and edge action to do nothing will give us a hand in stitching the points. Now we can slide those edges down and back. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the poly frame so I can judge how far I need to slide down. I'll do this by looking at the shading. When they match, I know I'm close to the same height. Slide the edge up a little to give it an angle. Then go ahead and match the edges in the middle.
Do a little crease adjustment and turn on dynamic to see how it's shaping up. We'll need to make some minor adjustments to smooth out those surface imperfections, but we're almost there. Let's get to work on fixing those surface errors with the Align Edge Action. Next we want to add in a couple of edge loops to set up our point split. Now when we split the point, remember to tap Alt to change the poly group. Then we can use the gizmo to adjust the location. Now go ahead and choose Inset Polygroup Island. Control click on the polygroup with the gizmo to unmask it. Then hold Control and move to extrude it back. Then scale it down a little bit to ensure it doesn't poke through the back. For the Z model brush, choose Uncrease for the polygon action, Poly Loop for the target, and Inner Targets for the modifier. Then we can switch it to Crease for the polygon action, Poly Loop for the target, and Outer Targets for the modifier. Then slide Edge Loop Complete to give it a bevel. Let's use the slice brush, slice in an edge loop on top, so when we add edge loops from the Z model brush, there won't be any pesky triangles to interfere with the operation. We might need to adjust the edge width when we place it on the motorcycle, but that's a quick fix with masking and the gizmo. 